Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi everyone, welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and if I'm a little nervous... I don't get nervous, but I'm nervous because I have the gardener of all gardeners, um, Joe Lample, with me. And, of course, you guys know him probably as Joe Gardner from Instagram fame, uh, his podcast, The Joe Gardner Show, his book, his newest book, The Vegetable Gardening Book, his online gardening academy, and, of course, Growing a Greener World. So he is basically a TV star, an author, a podcaster, a blogger, and all around (laughs) – incredibly nice guy because all I did was maybe I shouldn't say because now everyone's gonna <laughs> talk you. I just sent you a direct message on in- Instagram. Sometimes I get really brave and I just do that. And you responded and you said, yeah, give me a little bit more information and I'll be on your podcast. And I don't think I ate the rest of the night. And for me, that's saying a lot. So thank you. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome. And and I don't usually get nervous, but now I'm nervous. No. <laughs> you, you, you've given me a really high bar to live up to. Oh, that, boy. That was my goal. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no no but, pressure now. No, but seriously, you, you've, you've, so I always, my mom is an artist and, you know, and she makes no money being an artist. Thank goodness. Mm. You know, she, and so there are people who were, um, you know, just creative in one side. And it was funny because I was reading your bio and I love that you said your mom pushed you to go into, into business. Yeah. Smart mom. (laughs) Yeah. Smart mom. So uh, my mom told me, do what I love. And luckily that was gardening, but it it turned out well. Um, Mm. But I think you, you broach everything. A lot of gardeners don't have the ability to communicate and educate. They want to be just in their garden, which is fine. But we need yeah. we need good educators in the gardening world, and you're able to broach that. So I think that is why people just – you have a way of explaining, talking, soothing uh, people. So I, I won't build up you anymore, okay? I promise. So <laughs> um, we're going to talk about – Thank ra- you, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. <laughs> Before we get into our topic, which we decided to do raised beds um, – I always, and people know, I always like to hear about people's background. I always like to know how they got from point A to point C. Was it a, a yes. straight line or was it a zigzag? Were there uphills mm. and downhills? So um, you could start it. You could start from when you were, you know, in the womb, or you could start when you know from <laughs> yesterday. How about from eight years old? How's that? That works. That works. Okay. Everybody loves a great story. I'll tell you. That's one of the reasons I I started the television series Growing a Greener World was because I knew there were a lot of great gardeners out there with great stories. And I wanted to be the one to tell those stories. And, you know, thankfully, you know, be having, I guess, maybe an ability I didn't know that I had as well was the um, pulling that story out of those people Mm -hmm. and being able to do it in a way that, you know, translated into entertainment too. So anyway, that that's fast forwarding. Let me go back a little bit to eight years old and that was when I was a kid growing up in Miami, Florida. And I had older brothers, but the oldest, next closest one to me in age was five years older than me. So that puts him at 13 at the time. He didn't want to hang out with his little eight-year-old brother. So I'm left at home with my dad, which was fine. He's out there. I called him the weekend warrior because he's the guy that works all week and then comes home on the weekend and mows the grass and edges the driveway and cuts the bushes and all that stuff. So I loved hanging out with him. That was my highlight of my Saturday. But by the end of the day, when he had finished all his chores, he was out of energy, but I still had a lot. <laughs> so I'm running around the yard. And at some point I ran over, literally ran over uh, a bush that my dad had been working on and trimmed it up and everything. And I broke one of the branches off the, off the side of it. I'm like, oh no, what do I do now? 
And I didn't want to get in trouble. Not that I would have gotten in trouble, but I just, you know, what do you do? I wanted to cover my track. So I took that broken branch. I stuck it right into the ground next to the base of the plant and, and put soil over the bottom of it and made it look like it was part of the plant. <laughs> <laughs> went about my business. But I, you know, I, I didn't give it much thought after that really, but about, I'm guessing it was two months later, I came upon that bush again and it jogged my memory that that was the one I had broken the branch on. And I, I went down to look at the broken branch to, you know, and it, I couldn't find it at first because it had sprouted new leaves and it had started to form roots. And I'm like, what just happened over the last eight weeks? And I was just in awe. I literally was in awe about that. I couldn't understand. I couldn't get my head around how that happened. I thought it was going to be dead. And here it is coming back to life. And that I've said this many times, but that is clearly the moment that I became hooked on horticulture. And so from that point forward, and I'm talking about from every day from then until now, and tomorrow it will be another day, same thing. I've been so enamored and engrossed and in awe of gardening and horticulture and how things grow because it just blows my mind that that happens. And so every day I've tried to learn more than I knew the day before. And I've, I've, and endeavor to put my hands in the soil every day in one form or another. And, you know, so from there, I just kept planting stuff and I didn't stop. And I got busier and busier with it. I loved every day more than the day before. And that's how I got to the point where my mother and I were having that conversation about what to do in college. And I wanted to go into horticulture. And she said, that's fine. But why don't you double major and get a business degree too? And I thought, hmm, you're a smart lady. Yeah. She it really yeah. is the smartest person I've ever known. And um, I took her advice, thankfully, for the first time probably <laughs> up to that point in my life. And um, so I came out of school and she was right because when I was ready to graduate, a lot more people were interested in someone coming out with a business degree than a board degree. Mm -hmm. So I took a job in the real corporate world with a suit and tie and all that stuff. And I kind of hated it. Um, but I did it for a while until I knew I didn't know where the job was going to come from, but I knew in my heart of hearts that I was destined for horticulture professionally, but I didn't know when that would come about. And by the time it finally did, I'd kind of built up a, an income level that was sufficient to support my family at that time of four, you know, two two daughters and my wife. And so I, I couldn't just backslide into something that was significantly less in, in income than I was at at that point. Yeah, that probably wouldn't have gone over well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <with the> wife. <laughs> hey, Not I for think anybody. I'm, I think I've decided I'm going to follow my dream today. And by the way, that yeah. comes with a 50% pay cut. <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately, I was patient. I did buy my time. But I do recall those days in the fancy office on the 23rd floor looking out on a cold January morning at the guy cutting the grass, the landscaping crew down below cutting the grass out front side of the building thinking, I want to be that guy, oh. <laughs> but, but realizing that I, I just, that that's not a move I could make. But anyway, fortunately, uh, a magazine editor had uh, learned of me through word of mouth about my expertise in or one of the, my skills in, in turf management, because I was kind of diverse. But anyway, she asked me to be a regular columnist for this magazine. And before I'd ever met her in person, she got an email blast from HGTV about a new television series on DIY network that was in place except for the host. Everything was mapped out. They had it all contracted. The budget was there. The Everything was there except the host. They, they were looking for that host. And so they described who they were looking for in an email blast to all these gardening media people. And she saw it and said, this sounds like you, Joe. I've not met you yet, but I know you well enough to know this is you. And they just don't know it yet. So you need to meet these people. And so long story short, I managed to um, to meet the producer and get him to have lunch with me. And he did. But it was the most uncomfortable, awkward lunch I'd ever had. And I had lots of lunches with strangers. But uh -huh. this guy held his cards to his chest and I couldn't read them mm -hmm. whatsoever. And at the end of the lunch, it was literally that thing you hear about, like, don't call us, we'll call you. If we're interested. And that's what he said. And if we are, we'll let you know. And he called me the next week and said, I, I talked to my executive producer about you. We're interested. We want to do a screen test with you. Can you meet us next week? And uh, and we'll send you a script and you will pretend you're the host and we'll get you on camera. And then we'll take that up to H if that passes, we'll take it up to our big meeting when we meet with HGTV to pick the host. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I can do that. And I'd watched a ton of HGTV shows before, mm -hmm. so I knew I knew what they did and how they did it. I'd just never been on TV before. So I, I went to the screen test. I did my thing, 
over and over and over without any feedback. They get just oh, kept no. saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. I'm like, oh my gosh, what? how about a little like more energy or can yeah. you do it with inflection? Something. But no, not, not one word. It was the weirdest thing. Kind of like that lunch I'd had with them. And uh, and then they threw me a curveball and said, okay, now pretend you're t- teaching us how to do a soil test. Because that wasn't a script they sent me. They just wanted to see if I could think on my feet. Mm-hmm. So I did the same thing over and over and over and over and over. No feedback. And then he said, okay, thanks a lot. We'll we'll be in touch. And I'm like, that's it? That's all, that's all I got <laughs> out of this whole thing? And uh, anyway, uh, I heard they they had the meeting. He called me. He said, look, they're really interested in you, but they're also wanting to look at a female. We haven't searched for a female yet. So we're going to have to take that time. And that's another six weeks. And then we'll let you know when we hear back from them. Six weeks later, I hear back from them. He says, they've narrowed it down to two people. There's a female they're considering and you're the male. So depending on the gender they go with, that's who it's going to be the host. (laughs) And then a week later, I get the call that they picked me. So that's, that started everything. And that was in 2002. And that was a three-year series on DIY about teaching people how to grow food. Every episode was a different crop. Uh, all the way from seed to harvest. It was a really brilliant concept. It mm-hmm. was just ahead of its time yeah. because not that many, you know, home vegetable gardeners mm-hmm. were out there in 2002, three and four. Uh, but today that's completely changed. Yeah. I mean, so anyway, I just went yeah. from there to, to another show, to another show and growing a greener world was the last thing I did, but that's been the past 12 years. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty funny. So yeah, I, I, I would, <clears throat> When they had me redo it and redo it, I would be really hesitant not to just then do it in a British accent or a mafiosa <laughs> accent, and then I would ruin uh, the chances. So. I didn't know what to do, so I just kept doing it like I thought I needed to do <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, there you go. You're like, okay, I'll. But just the night continue. before, when I yeah, the night before when I was you know I knew I was having to show up, I mm-hmm. had my script, and I that was the first time I had tried to practice it, and I did it in front of the mirror one time, and I felt so silly doing it in front of the mirror. I just didn't ever do it again did, ex- other than to learn the words. Yeah. You did know? you veer off the script? Because I know, um, you know, I do live TV, but as soon as I'm given a script, yeah. if I don't get it the first time, like, then I'll just sort of ad lib and get the idea of it. So... I, I or, think I stuck to it. You did? I, okay. I think I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just for me, like, going off of a script is like, oh... I have to, I mean, no. maybe it's because my memory sort of sucks these days. But. Well, I, you know, I didn't know better one way or the other, but it's a good thing I did because yeah. that entire series was mm-hmm. completely scripted oh. down to the second. Wow. Down to the second. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. For the whole show. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Well that, I mean, that's, that's great. And that's, and then from there you just, obviously you just took off with the books and then, you know, this whole new thing called podcasts came about and, yeah. um, so where are you, where do you live now? I live in it just North. I live in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And actually it's a, it's a city called Milton, which is in Alpharetta, which is 30 miles North, Northeast of downtown Atlanta. So it's all part of Atlanta and I'm on the North East side. And what north, zone north is side. that? Cause that's what gardeners. 7B. 7B. Yeah, 7B. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I'm nine, like, um, yeah. so we, we just got out of some 116 degree weather. And then now, I now know. yeah, it was brutal. Where are you exactly in I'm California? Central Valley. So I'm about an hour, inland? hour inland of San Francisco and okay. two hours. Um, I'm about 40 minutes from uh, Sacramento. So I, I work at UC Davis. If you've okay. heard of UC Davis. Yo, so, of course. Yeah. I was just in Sonoma two weeks ago for a oh, week. Yeah. And uh, I left the day before the heat wave moved in. Yeah. Literally, I'm up against the foothills that if you go over, mm-hmm. you go into Sonoma. Um, so yeah, no, no humidity. Uh, I think mm-hmm. the humidity was like six, 15%, if that, um, wow. but we want to talk about raised beds. And before I, we start okay. getting into the nitty gritty, I'm going to say how much hate mail do you get from husbands <laughs> who write, <laughs> dear Joe, my wife wants raised beds. And what does she yeah. do? She looks online and sees Pinterest and goes, honey, I want these raised beds. This is perfection. <laughs> and the husband's like, no, you can't have that. Or is that just me? Or is that just what happened to me? <laughs> it's happened. Okay. It's happened. Yeah. Yeah. They're beautiful. Um, Thank you. And so, you, you know, but we don't want to stress that you have to have perfect raised beds. We want to get into sort of yesterday I gave a talk and someone said a raised beds better than in ground beds. So I want to start with why you grow vegetables gets primarily vegetables but of course you could grow mm-hmm. flowers and stuff in raised beds mm-hmm. why people may want to grow in raised beds versus the ground and 
is there one necessarily better than the other? Okay. All good questions. Okay. So we'll start with why do I grow vegetables and raised beds? Mm-hmm. Is that a good place? That's a great okay. place. Uh, I, I just love growing food. I love it because it's, um, it, it can be very challenging. Uh, it, it takes a longer growing cycle and there's more happening from the time you put the seed in the ground or the seedling to the time that you're harvesting the fruit from that plant. And along the way, especially where I live, we've got lots of diseases and pest issues. And, um, you know, I love myself a good challenge. So, (laughs) you know, even all these years later, growing food for years and years and years, it just still fascinates me. Plus there's nothing better than growing your own food and controlling how you grow it so you know what's actually going into your body because you've been there the whole time monitoring the process and deciding, you know, how you take care of it and tend to it and provide the nutrients and all of that. And so I I just really love all the hands-on activity involved with food growing versus, and and I have really become a fan of a lot more flower growing lately. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've all, you know, I love growing everything. Let let me be clear that I have a five acre hobby farm here and I have my big raised bed garden, but all around where I never really take the cameras, I have lots of uh, native plant landscape beds mm. and I love my native plants and I grow a lot of that. I just don't ever bring the cameras out there. But uh, the food part is really where it, it, it does, it's kind of all hands on deck and it requires the most of my time, but it also challenges me intellectually and at no two days are the same, not to mention seasons, you know? So there's always that that uh, new thing that I've not seen before or experiments that I want to try to make it different or, you know, it's just, it's never, 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 never boring. And it always awes me that, you know, it's, how how is it that every day is different, even though you've been doing the same thing, yeah. relatively yeah. speaking, for so many years? True. That just blows my mind. Very true. I mean, it, I I'm where a seedling comes up, I'm still amazed by it. There's yeah. still always the well, is it going to come up? And it's like, oh, it did. Look how amazing that is. That's why my probably favorite aspect of gardening is the seed starting process mm. and why I sow thousands of seeds a year inside is just to stand there and watch them yeah. 20 times a day you went, to see if I could notice anything different every 15 minutes. You went deep into seed starting, uh, what, two years oh, yeah. ago into, um, I think you turned it into a whole class. Well, yeah, we, we did our course on master mm-hmm. seed starting a few years ago. I'd been a seed starter for a long time, yeah. but I thought, what a great thing to um, really put into a course and walk people through everything I know Mm -hmm. and try to do it in an organized fashion. And it really is, it's our best, it's our most popular course by far. And um, we have a lot of students every year that just rave about it. And, and I love teach, I love teaching about it. And I never get tired of the questions. A lot of those questions we get over and over and over again, but you know, if they, if they have that question, I want to make sure that they understand it because it's, it's pretty cool how how those seeds germinate. Yeah. So it sounds like you went with raised beds because of critters and diseases in in the well, s- soil or potential diseases. It's it's some of that for sure. Uh so in Georgia, you know, we we're famous for our red clay. Mm-hmm. And red clay is actually really good. It's got a lot of minerals and nutrients in it. Uh but it's heavy, you know, so it holds a lot of water and it doesn't drain that well. And it's a little difficult to work with, but with edibles, you really need to have well-draining soil. So native red clay soil is not ideal. So the best way to work through that is to create your own growing environment. And and you could amend the existing native soil, but um, I chose, and I'd always admired these raised beds that you speak of that I have. <laughs> um, I you know, for, for years, I was building those raised beds for Fiskars. I was their spokesperson for a number of years. And part of what my job was, was to go around the country and into Canada two or three times a year, installing, overseeing the installation of those raised beds because their engineers designed those beds. Oh, okay. And I was so jealous every time I would go into a city and we, we'd start, you know, in the morning, it was, it was like a pop-up raised bed garden in a community garden around uh, maybe a public housing project or something like that. And there would be 150, 200 people from, you know, Fiskars and Home Depot or whoever the partner was. All the material would be there. We'd come in a day or two before. I'd lay out the garden. I'd designed it on paper before that. And then all the material would be sitting there. And by the end of the day, there were, you know, 10 or 15 of these massive, beautiful cedar 
four by 12 raised bed gardens, 18 inches high. And I'm like, lusting every time this happened. And I always said to myself, if ever, ever, ever I have an opportunity to have this kind of bed in my garden, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> after three or four years of that, and I'd started my series Growing a Greener World in 2009, I said, this is this is the opportunity. I mean, I need a garden set here in my mm -hmm. farm and uh, it's a big spend, but it's only a one-time spend. And I'm still in touch with those engineers that designed those beds. So I called them up and I said, guys, I want to build those beds down here in my, my garden. Can I fly you down for a weekend and uh, I'll, I'll buy you pizza and beer and we'll hang out for the weekend and build these beds? And they, they said, yes. Wow. <laughs> and so uh, over a weekend, literally okay. just a weekend, Friday afternoon to Sunday at noon, we, we banged out all those 16 big raised beds. That that's yeah. So there's 16 of them. And can you go through? Yeah. You you briefly just went through the specs, but they are cedar. Any particular cedar? Western red cedar, and they're six by six in diameter. So they're nice big square, yeah, tw twelve foot long timbers. They're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And then they're four foot wide, and they're stacked three high. So that makes them 18 inches high. And that dimension was the dimensions that they had specced when they built those. But I just found them to be so perfect for height. First of all, 18 inches is the height of a chair. So you, when you sit down, you feel like you're sitting on a chair and they're wide enough to accommodate your butt. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. And when you're weeding, um, you know, it's kind of easier to kind of lean onto the edge of the bed and weed into it. And um, they're very pretty. You know, they're very mm -hmm. attractive. They look nice. Yeah. And, um, and then the soil, back to the soil and the reason I have the raised beds. And the height that I have them is that 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 provides all the depth that any root from any plant that I'm growing in my edible garden that's they're going to need. I mean, it's plenty of room for that. So uh, there's the height. And then as far as the width, that really doesn't matter. It's whatever your garden can accommodate. The the dis, the 12 feet part, the, what is that? The length mm -hmm. and the width are, is four feet wide. And that's as wide as you'd want them because you don't want them any wider because then you're likely to have to put pressure onto the soil as you reach into work. And you never want to do that. You always want to reach into the middle of the garden bed without having to put pressure in the soil. And so four feet wide is, is really ideal for that. So there you have it. And, and then filling it with soil that was really good, high quality top soil, about 50% of the bed contain really nice high quality contains really nice, high quality top soil. About 30% is compost that I both made and had to buy because that's a lot of compost all yeah. at once. And then the rest is 20% mixed various things like vermicompost and semi-composted shredded leaves and some chicken manure that we've got from our ra for rabbits and, and uh, chickens and then some rotted hay and things to make up that remaining 20%. And so that mixed all together created just the most amazing place to grow your plants beats the heck out of the hard heavy clay yeah. that I had. So <laughs> let's I, just say that. I I want to go back to that um because I think the a lot of times people will just go and buy uh potting soil. So I have clay soils here, pretty heavy clay soils. We don't get songs written about our clay because <laughs> it's just <laughs> not the beautiful red clay of Georgia. Ours is like gray clay of Central Valley. Um mm. and and you know I try to tell people in this area that it's it's not it's like you said, clay tends to be full of nutrients. So there's not a mm. problem with that. Is it a pain to dig? Of course, when it's really mm. wet, which you never want to yeah. dig into wet soils, it's a pain. And then when it's really dry, uh, we don't get any summer irrigation. So, or rain, I should say. Uh, yeah. And I imagine you do. We do. Yeah. So we could control. And so I find that it's actually... Um, and we're in a severe drought. So I find because my raised beds, I did uh, potting soil and then I have to water those almost every day versus my in-ground beds heavily mulched every seven to like 10 days. Um, so I like the fact that you added topsoil to your pot, mm -hmm. your raised beds, because that has a better, wa I'm guessing the topsoil has a better water holding capability than just potting soil. It does. Uh, you know, potting soil is designed to drain really well. Mm -hmm. And um, topsoil, that's not in the specs for topsoil. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no real definition for topsoil, but really it's just that decomposed top layer of soil in nature. But, you know, 
when you buy it by the bag, it's manufactured by just probably a lot of wood product that's just composted down is really what you're probably paying for. But the stuff that I got, um, there's a big supplier of soil products near me. And I went and looked at it before I ever decided yeah. that's what I wanted, mm -hmm. you know. Not all topsoil is created the same. Let's just say that. No, and I, yeah, exactly. I've seen some that looks like it's just filled dirt, full of like yeah, rocks. Yeah, you, you get what you pay for. Let's mm -hmm. let's use that as the margin of how we measure it. You get what you pay for. Yeah, and then then you add to compost because that's going to be your your source of uh, nutrients and microorganisms. And mm -hmm. then basically, it sounds like you took whatever organic material that could break down and added that into into it. I did. And I mixed it. Initially, I mixed it all together. So it was a, one conglomeration of everything mixed together. Because if you layer things and just like a cake, you know, if you just layer it and leave it as a layer, drainage can be impeded by that. There's a lot of studies now that show that when you go from one substrate to a next, if you change texture or porosity, the, the water tends to stay in the upper level, like mm -hmm. a sponge, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I knew that, but, uh, so I, I had mixed it all together cause I wanted that one big happy environment of all of that stuff playing nicely together. And it, it was a good, it was a good play because it really, I, I had a, an amazing first year and, um, it was, you know, it was nice. It was, let's just say it was yeah, really nice. Compared to growing <laughs> in the ground. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I imagine af even after the first year, you saw a decrease in volume, which is going to happen with organics. Mm -hmm. um, I did. Go ahead. How did you remedy that? And is that something every season after every major planting season, do you add or do you just add back once a year to get one nutrients back in and two to get the volume back up? I top dress only about an inch twice a year. Mm. So the I, I don't get a lot of degradation in the in the volume anymore um, because I'm, you know, adding twice a year, an inch at a time. Okay. And, and that's with my compost. And now, and for years now, I've just really, I've only top dressed uh, because the microorganisms and the, you know, the soil food web is pulling that down pretty fast. The the other thing that I do that is really helpful is one of those two times that I'm top dressing. And when I do that, it's in between seasons. So the first time I top dress is before I plan out my warm season garden. So that I usually I'm doing my top dressing in late March in, or mid March, and then in the next round is after I pull most of my warm season crops out. So that would be late August for me. I'm coming back in with more of my homemade compost and just putting about an inch on the surface. But one of those two times, and usually it's in the spring, I use a broad fork, and so I go, I step on the edge of my garden beds, and that's the other reason why having a six inch wide bed is nice because I can step up on the edge and use my broad mm -hmm. fork and. If for those that don't know, it's kind of like a pitchfork with very thick, wide tines that are about eight inches long. And, you know, I, I stick that down into my garden bed soil and there's a handle on each side. So there's, imagine a bar going across uh, like a foot, a foot, a place to put your foot. It's like a steel bar. And under that bar are the tines, like a pitchfork. And I step on the bar and on each end of the bar coming up towards me are long handles. And then you can just rock that handle. So you stick, you shove the tines into the soil surface until the tines are fully into the soil and you step on the bar and then you just rock the handles back and forth a little bit. And those tines provide enough opening in the soil surface without tilling it to when you come back in right behind it and top dress it, some of that compost is going down eight inches into that soil. So I help the compost get down into the soil through that, okay. that um, broad, okay. I called it. It's a broad fork, but yeah. I call it broad dressing because I use the broad <laughs> fork to top dress. Got it. Okay. So you're trying to, you're incorporating some of that as well as leaving some on top, which you know, the rains are going to help push it in yeah. as well. So yeah. is, do you find that um, that's enough that you don't need to fertilize or do you fertilize? It's enough. Um, I, I don't fertilize very often at mm -hmm. all. I, okay. I, um, depending on what I've got growing, like for tomatoes, you know, when they're, they're, they're getting started and I grow a lot of tomatoes down here. Mm -hmm. So they're getting established. I'll, I will help them a little bit and I'll use a, a soluble or a concentrated liquid fertil fish fertilizer, uh, every maybe two weeks for just a few rounds. And, um, that's pretty much it. I, 
I just find that my plants do very well with just the compost. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, you know, all these years of continuing to build your soil with all that organic matter. And it's so full of life because I don't use any any pesticides or herbicides. It's just, it's thriving in there yeah. and you can see it. And so it just, other than a little bit of supplemental fertilizer, I don't do much. Yeah. I'm, I'm constantly trying to get people aware that most people over fertilize. They do. Um, it's, I it's, agree with that. Yeah, they see uh, just a discolored leaf and, oh, better fertilize. and Or I'm not getting fruit, better fertilize. And it's, in fact, it, you know, could be inhibiting fruit. So I'm, it's, I know people are going to follow exactly what you do and say. So that's great that you just say mm. you fertilize with a mild nitrogen to fish emulsion to get it going. But it's all about, like you said, feeding that soil, getting that the nutrients in, in the soil and also getting the top dressing in before. Not You yeah. can do it right when you're planting, but it's going to take a while for it to break down. So you're almost top dressing for the season after that. Um with a little bit of, you know, some of that will be released into the soil pretty quick. Yeah. You know, a way to think of that is I, I sometimes talk about um, when you make improvements to your soil, it's not all that different than when, you know, a bank account where we make deposits into our bank account because, you know, we need the deposits in there first before we can start making withdrawals. And in our garden, the plants are making withdrawals of the nutrients through the roots and the nutrients need to be there if those plants are going to survive. And so, I make those deposits via the top dressing of the compost or nutrients or both before I put my plants in each year, just to give, just to ensure that there's that extra bit of, you know, good, fresh, mm -hmm. organic matter through compost so that they are, they can take all they want because it's there. Do you ever just um, leave in, you know, for vegetable gardens, if there's any, of course, uh, suspicion of disease or, you know, if there's pests, it's a good idea to, you know, take it out. But do you ever just clip up the greens and leave them in there? Do you ever leave any uh, root systems in there? I do. You I do. do. Okay. On on most of the things that are non-woody, like the, um, like uh, eggplant is a very mm -hmm. woody root system. And, uh, you know, you've got the feeder roots out, out towards the far ends, which are, will break down faster, but that lignin in that, those roots just sits there too long for me on some of those bigger woodier plants. Mm -hmm. And so I'll probably pull those out. Um, and I'm speaking from just doing that this week <laughs> and all, and all the time. I mean, so I'm referring to that, but yes, I pull out the woody stuff, but like my brassicas, they, I always just cut the, well, most of the brassicas, I just cut those back at the soil level and uh -huh. I leave the softer roots in the soil for them to break down and just return some nutrients right in place. Okay. That's good to hear. Cause I think it's been, I think it's been sort of pushed down gardeners that, oh, you can't leave any debris in your vegetable gardens because of disease. But that's only if you suspect there's a, a disease. Other than that, it's great organic material. You might as well just leave it in there instead of pulling it out, put it in the compost bin. It's going to degrade in the soil. So, and I will add, that's a good point that you made. If I if I have um, a known plant that's diseased mm -hmm. via a soil borne pathogen, those diseases are entering through the roots, mm -hmm. and so I don't want to leave those roots. I mean, I already have the pathogens yeah. in the soil, yeah. unfortunately, but I don't want to increase the pathogens that are in there by leaving diseased roots there. So those come out Yes. if I know that the disease was from the soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other than that, I leave them in place, yeah. like you said. Um, and then I imagine you rotate your, do you rotate your tomatoes or are you, are you pretty aware that there's not diseases? So, Well, I, so this is that do as I say, not as yeah. I do thing. <laughs> I, um, the reason I have pathogens in my soil is because I kept planting the same plants from the same family in the same place too long, too huh. many seasons in a row. Mm -hmm. And eventually that catches up to you. And, um, so I'm, I pay the price for that now and I have no choice but to rotate. And I, and I'm a big believer in rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wasn't very good at doing it myself, even with 16 beds, but now I have to, and I do. And the way that I do that, because all of my beds have been overplanted by the same families, I, um, I use straw bales and grow bags and that's my newfound space that buys me those 
three or four extra seasons before I plant them back in those beds. I, I did see that. I did see your grow bags and I saw your nice trellis and I actually, that sort of inspired me. And, you know, because every year I change up the garden too. It's constantly yeah. changing. That's sort of fun yeah. already. I'm thinking about next year and the design. And um, so, you know, we're talking about your beautiful beds, but if people one, don't have the space for 16 beautiful beds, or they can't build something themselves, or, you know, the cost of wood is pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good these days. Um, yes. The the grow bags are away. Um, and what are some other options for raised beds? And you said hay bales. Really, a raised bed is anything, like you said, that you could control the environment. Right. It's just a control growing environment above ground. So that whether it could be a container, it could be a raised bed, it could be a straw bale. And I'd say straw bale over hay bales because there is a difference in that the oh, hay yeah. bales would, that's a forage crop and it just tends to break down faster than a straw bale. And the thing down here, I say down here, but really all over the country, this is a problem, but persistent herbicides are just prevalent all over mm -hmm. these days. And, and hay versus straw is more frequently sprayed with this persistent herbicide because as a foraging crop, the people that are growing the hay, they want to deliver clean hay to their customers. So they want it to be free of broadleaf weeds and the persistent herbicides are what kills off the broadleaf weeds while still allowing the hay to be safe for their cows uh, or the or whoever's eat horses. Mm -hmm. I'm not cows. I should I take that back. I meant horses. I, I, uh, I had no clue. I'm like, uh huh. Sounds great to yeah, me. Cows yeah, eat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but um, but the, what happens is we take those. If if we had hay that we were using that for, there's a very good chance that it may have those persistent herbicides in it. And and then we we think we've got a great raised bed environment, so we plant into that. And all of a sudden, our plants are dying because the persistent herbicide, as soon as the roots come in contact with it, and it's just parts per billion is all you need of that herbicide. And it kills our plants potentially. Not every plant, but tomatoes, for example, or peppers, and mm -hmm. they're very susceptible, beans and so forth. So anyway, straw is not nearly as susceptible to that because it's a different kind of crop. And it's just not, it's not a forage crop. Okay. So it's not sprayed the same way. But straw bales are great. Uh, and they're And they're really... They're amazing. I have to say, a few years ago, I became sold on them when I, my, I have a good friend, Craig LaHoulier, who's, you know, he's, he's an expert internationally with growing tomatoes. And he converted from grow bags in his driveway to straw bales. And he's, he grows the most amazing tomatoes year after year in straw bales. And he grows two tomato plants per straw bale. So that's basically 10 gallons per half bale. And, um, they just, they blow you away on how cool they are and how well they do. So that's an easy one for people because yeah. you can mm -hmm. you can find those straw bales at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever, and um, it can be an instant garden for you, almost instant garden for you. But I I am still a huge fan of grow bags because uh, they come in all different sizes. They're super convenient. At the end of the season, you can just wash them out and fold them up and store them wherever you want. Uh, they've got handles on them. They come in nice colors, depending on the size that you want. You can get any size that you want, and they're great for a lot of things. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm it's big, I'm big on grow bags. Yeah, I think it's great for people with small space for storage. Yeah, and if they just want to grow a tomato or you know an eggplant, and then um, and one thing is here in the Central Valley, it, I find they can dry out a little bit. Um, yeah. cause we don't have the humidity, but if the, the larger grow bag, the, you know, the less water you'd have to give it. If you have very small ones, just like a pot, it's going to dry out faster. But I do know Absolutely. people who, who love those, uh, going back to the, uh, straw bales, does he replace them every year? Yeah, you, they don't, they don't last. Okay more than a year typically yeah. because you are watering them a lot and mm -hmm. they're they're going to just break down pretty quickly but then they go into the other thing I love about those is I put them into my compost bin and uh they are such a great carbon source. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a nice way to bulk up your compost quickly. Are are you a fan of any of the you know you see the the uh like the troughs um the feeding troughs or the water troughs that some people do their whole entire garden in. Are you a fan of those? Have um, do you see any negatives about those? You know, I I'm I don't 
I'm not a I'm not a fan just because I don't have it. I have not used them and I've not personally experienced them, but I have troughs for in my farm for my horses. <laughs> okay. As long as there's drainage in there, yeah. I don't see any reason not to. Okay. I mean it's a place to hold soil yeah. or whatever your growing media is and put your plants. Yeah. And I think it's a great idea. I think you make use of what you've got. Yeah, I have a couple of them and and the really like shallow ones I don't recommend yeah. because of, of, yeah. once again, root space. Uh, but I see some of these beds and uh, I think I'm traumatized from our 116 degree week, even though we it's hot here. But, but I always tell people, mm. I said, you know, think about where yeah. you live because if you have a whole entire garden of those metal beds and then you have a gravel path, there is so much reflective heat so much heat yeah. and it's always the roots right by that metal wall that could really heat up. So you might be killing off some of the the roots right by the edge just because of the heat right there. But See, if- that's, yeah, that's a good point that you say. And that's why I couldn't speak from experience to say, you mm-hmm. know, those things that you just said, because I didn't think through that, but that's a good point. Um, what other wood options are there? So you did cedar. I know I have um, redwood. Are those t- the two pretty much major wood choices. And I'm sure you get the question all the time, pressure treated wood. Right. Right. Okay. Let's talk about that. So, you know, my preference is untreated, non-chemically treated wood. Hardwood would be the choice, but I want it, I want people to, to use that wood from sustain, sustainable sources, whether that's, you know, from their own property that they've been able to mill that down, or they know that it's, you know, forest steward council wood that, you know, is coming from a place that hasn't been ravaged just to, you know, make a buck. So that's the first thing. And in hardwood, I mean, all wood these days is way more expensive than it used to be, but hardwood is more expensive, but it lasts longer too, you know, keep that in mind. But, um, so whatever, whatever you have access to hardwood wise will probably work. If you can get the size boards that you want and it's hardwood because Hardwood is most often regionally sourced. And so some people are going to have access to cedar and some people are going to have access to redwood and some people have access to whatever the other various woods are. So there's that. And then as far as pressure treated wood, I mean, it is drastically different today than it was Mm -hmm. back in the nineties when it used to be, you know, CCC, which is had the arsenic Mm -hmm. in it or or C, uh, what is it? CPCF. I can't remember now. But the A was for arsenic. Mm-hmm. That's Actually, the important like, oh, part. <laughs> well, that's the part that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, has a, has uh, arsenic. Anyway, <laughs> yes. The arsenic was a bad thing. And so that would leach and that was a big risk. And so that's fortunately gone away for consumers. I mean, I think it's still available, but not in the consumer market. So now that arsenic component has been replaced by copper. So now it is CCC, but that's not nearly the risk. And copper is a is an element that plants need in small amounts. And, you know, so we shouldn't be afraid of copper, even though it is a metal that builds up in the soil over time. But the in my studies on the current source of pressure treated wood and what's used to treat it, the copper is the thing that is, it's not really a concern, but it's the one that the component of the treated material that you consider and talk about. But the bigger risk from what I've studied, and I've written about this, is the amount of copper that can rub off on your skin as you're working in the garden, that risk is greater than the risk of uh, carbon leaching into the soil and then being taken up by the plants. Because first of all, metals are typically bound Mm -hmm. to soil particles so that they are not finding their way up into the plant. And if they did make it up into the plant, the plant's going to show it before you would harvest it to utilize it for food. Mm -hmm. So there's a long tail there of warning signs, even if the metal gets into the plant for you to know that this is probably not something you want to eat. And, and so I don't, I don't use treated wood. Um, you know, someday at some point I'm going to have to replace my raised beds, you know, they're not going to last forever, no. but, no, <laughs> but, but, uh, they, who knows, they may yeah. outlast me. They're still going strong <laughs> 10 years later, but I can see some decline uh-huh. and I don't know what I'm going to do next. And I don't, I don't think I'm going to go with treated wood. Just, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, t- it's not, it's not the risk that it used to be. I'll say that. Yes. I think the, the warning now is if you didn't buy it yourself, don't use it because you don't know where the wood came from. So if, you know, your uh, neighbor's like, oh, I have all this pressure treated yeah. wood and, oh, I heard that pressure treated wood these days, you know, doesn't have arsenic in it. 
well, if you didn't buy it, don't use it. And um, I think I, I get questions, too, about the uh, uh, railroad ties because you could find those pretty cheap. You do, you do not want to use those. No. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that? Clearly stated on the government <laughs> websites, it is not recommended. Yeah. Yeah, because that yeah. is a, a carcinogenic. Um, yes. That's that's on there. And then, uh, I, you know, all these new um, – I mean, you, you you see what's out there on social media. I'm sure you hit your yeah. head against yeah, the yeah. wall uh, <laughs> a lot, too, about what's up out there. And I see people planting in old tires. And not, not, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Okay. So we just had to clear those because I know people are like, oh, look at my raised beds. And, you know, if you want to do an old toilet. That's fine. That's a raised bed. <laughs> right. It's I w- got the drainage. It's got the drainage. That is true. And it has two, you know, it has the top and it has the bowl. So uh, yeah. it's got drainage and, you know, it's ceramic. So that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Your your beds are open at the bottom, right? Yeah. Reluctantly, that's it. And I'll tell you, you know, something I wish I, I wish I knew then what I know now, if we had that conversation and we were talking about raised beds, I'd say, I wish I had put what I tell other people to do. And that is to put some sort of wire mesh, like hardware cloth mm-hmm. around the bottom or across the bottom of it. Uh, and you know, for eight years, I dodged the bullet on that. But a couple of years ago, we had a really dry year. And in my garden, of course, with all the irrigation that it gets, uh, the soil was nice and moist. And so was the pathways around it because you have a little bit of overreach. Mm-hmm. And the and the moles in our case, those are the critters that, you know, basically make tunnels right at the soil surface and and make your grass, you know, uneven because it's mounted up as the as the moles are going tunneling underneath it. But they're after earthworms and insects in the soil. And so they found their way into my moist soil. And then they came upon my raised beds. And all they did was just tunnel underneath the six by six cedar timbers. And all of a sudden they hit heaven. And there's this sea, this bed of luscious, rich earthworm soil. So now they've got an endless unlimited buffet in every bed. And they're they're having the time of their life. Oh. And the way that I the way that I discovered this was one day I'm standing over one of my beds and I love to hand water with my watering wand because it's a chance for me to really eyeball my plants. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I have to stay still because I'm holding the watering wand down at that plant for 30 seconds or whatever. And so I'm watering this one plant. And as I'm watering it, the soil under the water is imploding down <laughs> into the bed. And I'm it's like a it's like quicksand or, wa- or uh-huh. volcano or whatever you call it, sinkhole. Yeah. It's like a sinkhole. That's what it is. And I looked at that. And I said, what the heck is happening? But I also knew right away what it was that caused that. And the and the moles had created such cavernous openings in the soil that these voids had been created. And all that we needed was a little bit of pressure from above to allow mm. it to implode into the, va- into the void that was made. And so... Um, that's all because I didn't put hardware cloth. It would have been the ver- the barrier to prevent those moles from coming in. And and now there's 30 yards, no more than that, 300 yards. I can't remember the math, but I got a lot of soil. If I if I had to fix those beds now, I'd be digging out a lot yeah. of soil. I have nor neither the time nor the money or the energy at this point to do that. So that would I just be, deal with it. Yeah, and, and so they came about. You said about five years ago, eight years ago. To uh, about two or three years oh, ago. Oh, two or three years ago. So they're they're there to stay. Or have uh, you seen a reduction? It appears to be. Okay. Yeah. All right. And they're hard to they're hard to catch. So yes, they are. I live in a, a middle of a, a walnut orchard and we have gophers. And that's why I went to raise beds. So I, I was lucky that when I built them, I, I added the the hardware cloth. Good and for you. Overlapped it, put it on the outside. Um, not just on the insides, but on the outsides, because they'll find find ways. So, yeah, I had enough problems of you know having plants get to a certain size. You come out and you're like, I know that's not lack of water, <laughs> and you go tug on it, and there's right. no roots. And I I watched a plant being pulled underneath by a gopher once, like the cartoon. Oh, I didn't think gosh, that was possible. I hear about this. I hear about it. Yes, oh. it's it's stuff of nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, you just watching it happen yes. before your eyes, you're so helpless because yes. by then it's done, you know, it just 
You're I, watching the tail end of it. Oh, yeah, but I, I always I expand. For you. So, you know, I, I uh, convinced my husband that I had to build all raised beds and that, oh, I can't put anything into the ground. And then the past couple seasons, I've just been eking out space in the ground. But I mm. have my set plants. So, you know, I put some tomatoes in the raised bed. So I know I'm going to at least have those tomatoes. And then whatever's yeah. in the ground. And this year wasn't wasn't too bad actually so you know makes me wonder i'm like well i don't know if the drought last year um but it wasn't so bad but there's really nothing you could do we have so many and the tunnels are so extensive it's just (sighs) ridiculous but yeah hardware cloth and people say well what is that but it's it's like chicken wire but sturdier and and its grid pattern is much Mm short much smaller Mm -hmm. so you can get anywhere from a half inch square galvanized metal grid pattern to mm-hmm. one inch and maybe bigger, uh, but one inch should suffice. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty small for things they can't get through. And then I overlap yeah. it and then I actually wire the overlap parts together so they can't sort of fit their, it's war. It's war. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, and so do you have irrigation going to your beds? I do. I have raised I have raised beds with uh, drip irrigation or soaker hoses, depending on what I'm planting mm-hmm. in that bed. Some some plants do better with just a, a flow of water along the entire length of the hose. So those would be soaker hoses. Uh-huh. And other plants are bigger, like my tomatoes would be a good example, or peppers, or anything like eggplant that's bigger, where you want to target the irrigation with emitter heads. And so that's the drip irrigation mm-hmm. uh, component to it. And I have. The way that I'm able to do that is I have dedicated spigots going into each bed so I can tweak every season. Okay. And they're all on automatic time, all on battery powered timers. Okay. So you have uh, PVC lines coming up from the bottom. I do. And yes. then, and then, so you have an adapter um, yep. and each bed has its own timer and its yes. own. Oh, wow. Okay. So you could control each bed. Yeah. Nice. Hmm, the wheels are spinning in my head. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so how much rain do you get in the the summer? This uh, is- well, over the course of the year, we get about sixty five inches oh, on average. Oh, 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 hold on a second. Hold on, I have to brace uh, myself. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, it depends, Marlene. The summers are just you know these every year is different now. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah. you used to be able to count on that afternoon summer shower a few uh-huh. days a week. And and we'll go now for several weeks without any rain, and then we'll go for uh, several weeks with rain almost every day, and that's kind of what we've had lately. So we've had already this summer, now that we're coming out of it, we've had weeks of both. You know, we've had mm-hmm. a couple of weeks where it's dry, a couple of weeks wet, and back and forth, back and forth. So I haven't had to do uh, hardly any supplemental watering, and uh, that's been nice. That's but nice. it's you know. Yeah. Every year is different. And, and, you know, I I mean, obviously, since this is a raised bed, I still have to ask about the plants and the gardening. Yeah. So with the humidity, do you find, do you have, so you were talking about the soil and and you were saying you had diseases because you plant in the same spot. And I'm I'm imagining you probably have like fusarium. Is that or uh, phytophthora? Uh, fusarium is very common. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, But as far as, oh, so I saw the tour of your garden. So, you know, when you see Instagram pictures, you never know if they're just fudged, but you did a walk around garden and I literally Mm -hmm. did not see a single yellow leaf. I'm like, (laughs) where, where are the lower yellowing leaves? Cause you know, they're going to age. Um, uh, well, I can't say what is your trick because you just explained, you know, your your compost. Sorry, that was just a tangent. But do you ever get powdery mildew? Do you have downy mildew? What would you say is the biggest problem in your area or is it year to year? It's uh, it's not year to year. It's usually the same things over and over. And I, and okay. I don't plant okay. anything in my food garden that really is susceptible to downy or powdery mildew. So I don't get those just okay. by virtue of the fact that other than the monarda that I plant in my uh-huh. garden, which is susceptible yeah. to it, you know, that's a different story. But as far as my edibles, nothing like that. But I would say early blight and um, septoria leaf spot, mm-hmm. fusarium, as you mentioned. And uh, unfortunately, we get some bacterial wilt uh, mm-hmm. here Okay. Another soil borne thing. But, you know, those diseases are coming in from all over. Yeah. So is, is oh, and back to your point about your observation, you're watching <laughs> that, that walk around video. Um, you know, it does look really pristine from and, and And, you know, that's because it's not that I don't get those things. I do. Uh-huh. But 
part of my protocol for disease management is to cut that out as soon as I see it yeah. or as soon as I can. Okay. So it's, it was there, but, um, you tied um, it up before you videoed. I, <laughs> yeah. Every, I mean, I do, I do every day as much yeah. as I can yeah. because it's yeah. going to spread and uh -huh. I want to reduce the chances of that happening. So, yeah. you know, I don't have a secret weapon. It, <laughs> I get it too, but I'm just very vigilant about um, sanitation yeah. with disease. No, that, that makes sense. Um, what about pests? Do you have, uh, besides the, the, uh, moles, um, insect pests, right? Yeah. Do you have, um, any? I don't, I do, but I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so what I've done just, here's the thing. I, I, I or I'm an organic gardener uh -huh. and I have planted over the years, enough diversity to attract a lot of beneficial and predatory insects into my garden. And then I am proactive in, in, in my inspections. I try to get out when I'm not on the road, I'm out of my garden every morning, just at least walking around. And if I see anything, I'm, I'm, I'm acting as soon as I can to mm -hmm. mitigate or minimize the risk of, you know, population explosions. So that helps combined with the presence of the beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. So that helps. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just trying to, look ahead and try to be proactive about what's coming or what. And be, and also the other thing is knowing just, first of all, getting your head around the fact that when you see a little insect that you don't know what it is, it's innocent until it's proven guilty yeah. because 99% 99% of the insects out there are not pests. They're, they're beneficial or neutral at best. So they're not going to do any harm. So you got to give them the benefit of the doubt. But if you don't know, pull out your phone and do Google mm -hmm. lens and it's going to tell you what it is. And if it is a pest, then, you know, deal with it. Mm -hmm. But if not, it's probably going to help you. And, and so just be patient. And the different stages. So everyone knows yeah. a ladybug, but not everyone knows the ladybug larvae. And, you know, not, well, the larvae is scary looking. It, it is. And se someone sent me a picture. Oh, what are these? And I think it took me two days to get back to them. They're like, oh, bummer. I squished them all. I'm like, yeah, that's that sort happens. of like innocent until proven, proven guilty. Um, and there's mm. so many more beneficials that aren't just the ones that we we see. And even if it's a bad pest, unless, you know, monitor it um, because the bad pest, you know, the good pests need those bad pests sometimes to munch away. I do the IPM at the um, yeah at the conservatory where I work. So I rear some of these beneficials and then I bring them in every week and they're amazing little things. They sure so, are. Yeah. Um, what is your go-to? So say you have, so yeah. so say you go and you monitor a pest and you're like, you know what, mm -hmm. this is getting out of the threshold range of what I, I want in my garden. Yeah, it's going to yeah, be yeah. able to handle. Do you so, just take a hose blast or? I do. Yeah, I'll do a hose blast. But okay. a lot of times well, with a hose blast, I'm trying to knock off aphids. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I'll check the leaves before I even do the hose blast because most of the time I see those lady beetle larvae there, mm -hmm. uh, already coming on at this point. And so the good, the good thing is when you garden long enough in the same location, you kind of get to know the ebbs and the flows and the seasonality yeah. of what shows up when, uh, and you know, with climate change, that's all changing as far as the dates of everything, but still you kind of know the patterns. And so, uh, I can kind of anticipate what I'm about to see if I'll look, you know, if I see the aphids and I know that I'm going to be looking for the lady beetle larva, and if I see it, I'm not going to hose them because I don't want to knock yeah. the good guys off too. And then I usually just let those alone. And next thing I know, my aphids are gone. But if I do have to do something, um, the first line of defense on the things that I know are going to get attacked, like if I plant eggplant, I know I'm going to get flea beetles. So I'll mm. put row cover. So I'll put a physical barrier up first and that takes care of that. And then if I find something that I can manually pick off, like we'll get Japanese beetles here. And uh, I never do anything other than just tap those into a cup of soapy water in the morning on my patrol when I see them. Mm -hmm. They can be pretty pretty destructive. But, you know, my garden, as big as it is, it isn't so big that I can't manage the population. And what a lot of people need to know, or everybody needs to know, but a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, your, your plants can take 35% defoliation or leaf damage without it really impacting production. So if you you know increase your level your threshold of tolerance talking about IPM mm -hmm. you can you can not resort to anything harsher than just manual control or just a little bit of patience until the good guys move in to take care of that. So I'm making note of what I see. I'm knocking off what I can into soapy water. Um more most of the time the biggest threats that I have are like 
army worms or cat, you know, some sort of caterpillar or yes. worm. Yeah. And then I'm using BT mm-hmm. and it depends on whether I use a powder or a spray BT. And, um, thankfully, knock on wood, that's, that's about as far as I have to go with it. Yeah. Yeah. You make a few good points. There is that you can't, even though I say your garden looks perfect, like you said, it's, it's not as leaves mm-hmm. age, they're going to discolor and you're going to have environmental forces acting on them. And that could be a few bugs, but yes, plants could handle so much damage. Um, You don't need your plants to look pristine. And a lot of times they grow out of it. You may have an influx, of course, of the aphids and just give it time. They'll dissipate. They're just coming out of diapause or, you know, just hatching and and they're, you know, found a place to latch onto and then they're going to go. And then the natural predators are going to come along and find out they're there and then do their their job. So I think it's this whole people see a pest they freak out or they see a hole in their leaf. And and I think that, you know, trying to change that mentality uh, people have of, ah, oh, my plant's going to die. I mean, yes, you know, if you plant marigold, snails and slugs are going to eat your plant overnight. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And that you're right about the seasonality. And that reminds me, I do use diatomaceous earth sometimes, mm-hmm. okay. DE. Yeah. Uh, and um, what else do I... Uh, Trying to think, is there anything else like insecticidal soap? Maybe sometimes, or maybe a yeah. botanical oil. Yeah. If I want to, if I want to do that, but I, I mean, I tell you, that's the exception to the rule for me. Yeah. And I, in your thing about timing, also, and how they grow out of it, that's also true for diseases because there are some plants that I've got out here, like you know, I talked about tomatoes a lot today, mm-hmm. and they are very susceptible to disease, diseases, and many of them get pulled out after they've been producing for a few weeks. Because they're just, you know, I'm tired of dealing with them, basically, yeah. and they've got a lot of disease. So mm-hmm. they come out. But some, I can see that they've got potential, and I know by now that they will grow out of it if I just leave them alone. And so as we speak, I've got, you know, I start off with 60-something tomatoes, but here we are in September, and I've got uh, four or five full-grown tomato plants out there producing large you know, tomatoes that have grown out of their diseases. And now they're lush and disease, pretty much disease-free because I just left them alone and gave them a chance to do that as I kind of thought that they would yeah. just from seeing that in the past. And it's nice to have tomatoes still growing yeah. and just being mm-hmm. patient with it. Mm-hmm. That's what happens here for us with, with the powdery mildew mm-hmm. and rust yeah. and most leaf spot is it's very seasonal early on in spring. And, you know, people see it on their hollyhocks or uh, we get late you know, season powdery mildew on our cucurbits. And by then I tell people, well, look at it's, you know, your plants dying down. So just take that, you know, you probably want to just, you know, get, get it away from, you know, the beds, but, um, but it's fine. It's very seasonal. And by the time it comes in fall, your plants are done anyways. So I'm like, don't yeah. bother even trying to treat it. Cause there's, there's no point, but yeah, I, yeah. I always tell some people when, uh, you know, uh, worked at a nursery for years and people would, literally this one person brought in a sample of a leaf every single day <laughs> from his one uh-huh. plant. Finally, one day I said, sir, step away from the plant. Your your homework <laughs> is to not look at this plant for like a week. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, so, you know, I'm like, you just, just can't. I mean, even though, like you said, you look at your garden every day because, you know, you know what you're looking for and, and you've been gardening long enough that you know when it's like, okay, concern. And, and, you know, you're going to, and that's what you said about what you love about gardening is you're constantly learning. And same with me. It, you're, I, we're never going to know everything. And if that day comes, then I'd be bored. <laughs> so yeah, This is true. And that's why, that's why I love gardening so much. As I said, I think in the beginning of this conversation, every day is different and no two days are the same. And so therefore it's never boring. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I'm already thinking, you know, as I'm getting ready to start planting fall vegetables, clean out the summer. I'm already thinking about next summer's vegetable garden of what I could do, you know, from seeing other people's gardens and then just seeing things that didn't go right this, this year. And, um, that's what, that's what makes it fun. So that's a great thing that you do is that it's the perfect time to be thinking about it because you're mm-hmm. still out in front of it and you're, it's, you're able to reflect on it because it's in your, just your recent rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. No time like the present to be thinking about next yeah. time. Uh, is there anything you want to add about raised beds or just um, in general um, before before I let you go? Because I could keep and talk gardening all day, all night. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I would just say that if anybody's not 
anybody that's a vegetable gardener that's not taking advantage of a fall garden is missing a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, here where we are in 7B, Atlanta, a lot of people, I think, deal with their summer garden. And, the, and by the time that their plants are finished, they're kind of, they're finished too. You know, they, they look at that as their time off for the rest of the year too. Yeah. But I am more excited and fired up this time of year going forward than I am really coming into spring into summer because everything with the exception of tomatoes, which I do love, uh, my favorite plants are what is in the garden that I just planted this week. That's going to be growing and I'm going to be harvesting over the next few months. And uh, those don't grow in the summertime. And that's true, you know, around the, most of the country. So yeah. uh, I would, just would want people to think about extending their season into the fall and planting the things that they can't mm -hmm. plant or that don't grow well in the summertime. Yeah, I imagine that's cauliflower and broccoli. And yeah, all the brassicas, mm -hmm. spinach, leafy crops, yeah. lettuces, arugula. Yeah, you're uh, very, just, I mean, you're, you're two zones off, but that's what yeah. we're planting too. Yeah. So, I mean, there are some people who live in areas that I think are going to see too much snow. But even then, hey, there's people who who garden in, in lots of snow. That would not yeah, be you, me. The cold, the cold <laughs> frames will hold some of that heat in and you can pull fresh carrots out yeah. year round. And, yeah. Yeah. So so what's – um so you have – um if people want to know more about Vegetable Garden, your book, The Vegetable Gardening Book. I love the title because it's just Thanks. The Vegetable Gardening <laughs> Book. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, do you guys sit around like, hmm, you know, let's come up with, hey, why not just The Vegetable Gardening Book? <laughs> well, I love when they said that's what they were proposing the title to be. And I think they do searches and uh, I don't know how it all works, uh -huh. but that certainly worked for me. Yeah. I just love the basic, simple title I, I of that. I like it too. <laughs> Yeah. So do you have any, you know, you have your, your, your podcast that you're, you're working on, um, yeah. your, your online gardening Academy, um, yes. your website, what's, what's your website? So everyone can find joegardner.com, joegardner.com. There you go. Yeah. Um, anything new in the works or anything like yes. that you could tell us? Uh, well, you mentioned the online gardening Academy. Mm -hmm. And so that's my, that's, that's something I created in 2018, uh, online courses for people who really wanted to go deep on certain subjects, mm -hmm. such as master seed starting or pest diseases and weeds or growing epic tomatoes or, you know, perfect soil recipe is a master class we have. So anyway, there are classes that people can pay a modest price for and have them for lifetime access. And we continue to update those at no cost. But people, our students, we've got a lot of students who just love our courses. And every time we put something out new, they just, they just get it because mm -hmm. they love what they've already gotten from us. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I've wanted to do, it's interesting that we're talking about this because when we started this conversation, I was telling you about that show I hosted on DIY Network called mm -hmm. Fresh from the Garden and what it was. Well, that was a great concept, but I mentioned that it was ahead of its time. It's something I've wanted to recreate for 20 years. And literally it's been 20 years, but I've been thinking about it since then that that show needed to be redone, but I needed to do it from my garden where I had control, mm -hmm. where I wasn't doing a script. I was just teaching from yeah. what I can do off script and have my growing environment and do it organically, which Fresh from the Garden did not do. Oh, okay. And and it's all updated 20 years later. A lot has changed in 20 years. Yeah. So we're creating it for the Online Gardening Academy, and it's coming out next spring, and we're calling it or Organic Vegetable Gardening. And it's, it's a program. It's a course, and it's a year-long program where every week we're bringing in top experts in their field on various subjects. So it's an immersive experience that we're pulling all our resources in. We took a year off from filming our television show this year to bring in the whole crew with all my team. And we're, we've been working on this course. I've been filming all year, documenting every crop I'm growing in my garden, the top 20 warm and cool season crops from start to finish for the course on how to grow it, plus all the best practices for how to be an organic gardener. So it is the most comprehensive thing I think I will ever have done. <laughs> and I'm super excited about yeah. it. I've been working on it all day like I have been for most days, mm -hmm. but usually we're filming, but today was a non-filming day. And I think people will love it. So anyway, that's all the Online Gardening Academy. And if people wanted to learn more, it would just be joegardner.com slash okay. learn. Yeah. And that will get them there. People want a one-stop shop. I mean, there's, yeah. there's information online and people go to it, but there's so much misinformation online. Thank you. It's information <laughs> overload. And it is, it is, it, it's like, it is, how do you know if it's reliable mm -hmm. or not? And what if you have a follow-up question? How do you get to that person? And what if the information changes and it's just a book? You know, it's yeah. just like, there's so many reasons why a one-stop shop from a 
what I would say is a trusted, reliable source, whether that's me or somebody else, is a really good thing to have in yeah, your back pocket. And it's great you're getting the experts because people who've been doing this for years, it's it's they're the people you want to go to. They're the people and and you know, you're smart enough to see like, hey, there's a tomato expert and this guy's that's all he does. Or yes. um, you know, that's why I love doing my podcast because I learn, you know, I'll sit there, I'll be like, oh yeah, I, I forgot I'm recording a podcast. I'm learning so much. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, so that that's great. I think, I mean, if someone only wants to grow maybe uh, peppers, they could, you know, do a deep dive on peppers on your, on, on it. Um, so, oh, that's great. That's exciting. That seems like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, it, it's a lot of work, but we, I mean, it's, it's just what, you know, going back to the, the month, my mother talking about uh -huh. this, she was, a, she was, I would, I don't think I ever said she was a high school teacher. Ah. And so I think I inherited her teaching uh -huh. gene. So I love to teach. Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing that on television for 20 something years now, but when I'm teaching on television, I'm just speaking to a camera lens and mm -hmm. I never know who's consuming that information and rarely do I ever get to interact with them because there's really no good facility to do that. Yeah. But with the online courses, there is the online forum, there's our student-only community. And so I am engaged with my students every day. And that's what I really love. Yeah. So and that element. Yeah. And I th I think the longer format is because there's so much. It's, it's yeah. you know, three, I do three minute segments on TV and they're always trying to get me to shorten it. I said, you're yeah. lucky I don't take over more time. Cause I'm like that, that gives you no time to go into any of it. Um, so yeah, yeah. but no, that's exciting. So joegardner.com and your podcast of course is the Joe Gardner show. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I follow you on Instagram and then I do you imagine you have uh Facebook, do you have Twitter? Uh, I do it, all at Joe Gardner. All and, at Joe Gardner. Okay. It, and Instagram is where uh, I'm most mm -hmm. uh, really pretty much my primary social media platform mm -hmm. of choice. But our yeah. brands and everything are on Facebook. But just spell Joe Gardner right. Make sure you. Sp <laughs> I'll spell it just to be clear: J O E G A R D E N E R. Because yeah. a lot of people leave that extra e out. Yeah, they it's do. Not an extra Don't e is an important. <laughs> e. It is. It's garden. Er. Gardener, right. Gardener, yes, yes. <laughs> right. Um, do you have TikTok? You know, oh gosh, <laughs> N yes and no. I <laughs> I was talked into open, starting an account, and I went to see if Joe Gardner was available, and it's not <gasps> because some dad set it up for his eight year old daughter to make dance videos on. <laughs> so <laughs> I. I just haven't gotten there yet. And I know I need to do it. And I just. No, it, no, yeah, fight I'm it. Frustrated. You don't need it. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure your, your PR people are like, don't listen to her. I'm like, no, don't do it. Fight it. Fight the resistance. <laughs> Nobody's pushing me to do it. I just, I yeah. read between the lines. And yeah. I, I, uh, I have a feeling it's inevitable, but I'm, yeah. I'm resisting. Maybe you could do garden dance videos. Well, <laughs> it, you know, that's the thing. It doesn't have to be that kind of stuff. It can be just informative, but yeah. I'm hard. Yeah. I, I, it's hard for me to do short form content. i yeah. I do too. My stuff is way too long to uh -huh. begin with. And I just, yeah, I got to get my head around it. And then I don't have the time. Yeah. No, <laughs> Listen to my I, excuses. I'm just making excuses. <laughs> no, I don't think it's an excuse. You got, you've got enough on your plate and, uh, I do. And, and I think what you're doing is, is the better service is really educating with long form. And cause if people really want to be gardeners, they're going to absorb all the information they can, um, versus just, you know, five seconds videos. Of just, yeah. you know, I'm I, not looking to be a TikTok star. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is great. <laughs> this is great. I'm so excited. I'm so excited you answered, you responded. You're so not, I mean, most people in the plant world are nice. Um, but you know, you're you're you you could have just you can't even, I mean, you're big enough that you don't even need to read your own emails and your own, you know, messages. <laughs> My husband's shaking his head. Um, so, uh, yeah, but everyone, if they haven't already checked it out, uh, joegardner.com. And until next time, everyone, happy gardening.